Um, so basically, my name is Maria. I'm co-founder of two wearable tech businesses. And why I chose this topic um, today is because I think it's very important to talk about IoT from a woman's perspective. Um, and as someone, as our first speaker said, um, IoT tends to be very unsexy industry. So I'm going to talk about wearable technology and fashion technology today. So. Um, let me just share my screen with you. Dot. Okay. Good. So, who am I? Um, I wear multiple hats uh, at the moment. Um, in my, I always say, my previous life, I was a corporate lawyer. Um, and then in 2014, I moved to London from Croatia and I started my career in tech. So I'm working as a digital marketing consultant and PR strategist and business advisor, startup mentor. But um, on, the, on the other side, I'm also co-founder of uh, two wearable tech businesses. My first wearable tech business is um, Keisha Smart Umbrella, which I'm going to tell a little bit more about later. And um, the most, uh, the, the later one uh, that I co-founded last year is Women of Wearables. Um, and I'm also a STEM ambassador. Um, I think it's very important for women to get into STEM um, if they have interest in this industry as STEM ambassadors, because that's a really good way of encouraging other women to, to get into this industry. So, um, so my, my next slide <laughs> has very appropriate title. Um, and why I want to talk about this, the problem first is because I want to tell a little bit more about how a lot of women in tech space feel about uh, you know being in the tech space. So tech industry is very much male dominated. I don't know how many you know women are there today on our meetup, but um, during the last few years, um, when when I went to different meetups and events and conferences here in London. Um, I've noticed that there are not many women in tech. Uh, usually there's around maybe like 80 to 90% men attending conferences. Um, and because my first business is wearable tech business, I was, I was inclined to meet more uh, female founders in, in the wearable tech space, in IoT space. But there almost haven't been any, um, which, which basically proved to be a very very big problem for me because um, I just wanted to, you know, to connect with like-minded um, female entrepreneurs and to see, you know, what are the problems that are, you know, they are struggling with and, you know, what kind of support they need. Um, and this is something that basically uh, led me to co-found my, my second business, Women of Wearables. But I'll first give an overview of um, wearable technology and fashion technology today. So, um, So in 2000, so, so here are some stats about women, about women in STEM, um, and I think that you know, as a as a female founder in this industry, I was pretty much aware that uh, the situation is bad, but um, recent studies have shown that it's it tends to be really really bad, especially uh, I would say in Europe, uh, because Europe and even UK has fairly young ecosystem when it comes to tech and startups. Um, the one in US is much more mature. So for example, uh, Crunchbase is a great study last year and uh, beginning of this year. So uh, they found that only 17% of startups have a um, female founder. Um, and a recent report by Silicon Valley Bank actually found that 68% um, startups had no women on their board of directors and like 53% of them didn't have any had no women in C-level management. So um, that's, I think, really, really big problem because um, young, younger women, uh, you know, junior, uh, you know, apprentices or developers or designers or even women in non-tech roles who, who get into these companies, um, they want to see uh, role models and female role models especially. So uh, if they don't see a woman on a higher position, then uh, they might be, uh, you know, not... I would say they might be turned off from from applying to to work um, to just you know continue their career in that company if they don't see any women um, in a higher position. So, and also, 
Um, when it comes to you know niches in tech, uh, in healthcare, and definitely you know digital media proved to have uh, the highest ratio of female-founded businesses. Um, and unfortunately, uh, problem doesn't stop there because um, we need more female investors as well. Because um, according to this report, only 3% of venture capitalists and 7% partners of uh, top venture firms are female. Um, and we need more female investors because female investors tend to um, invest more in, in female-led businesses. Um, if we don't get more investors, um, and then, then in like 20 years, 10 years uh, time from now, we will have still we will still have the same problem, um, not having enough female founders. So, let me give you an overview of wearable technology and fashion technology. So you all heard about that, and I won't you know repeat what's out there on the internet. I'll just try to give an overview, and you know try to show some products that um, women that I met or interviewed over the last year or so um, have been building. So obviously there's a lot of fitness trackers and smartwatches, but a lot of people who are not very familiar with IoT and consumer products in IoT industry um, don't have a um, very good idea what is out there besides smartwatches and fitness trackers. So there's, there are all, all sorts of kinds of jewelry, smart jewelry and, and smart textiles. Um, so uh, smart clothing, e-textiles. Um, on this slide, um, you can see a Twitter dress. Uh, not sure how many of you heard about Twitter dress designed by Cute Circuit. So Twitter dress is a dress that has embedded uh, sensors and Swarovski crystals. So Nicole Scherzinger from Pussycat Dolls wore this dress in 2012 when um, EE launched 4G network in, in the UK. So it works in a way that whoever uses the hashtag, um, the Twitter address, uh, tweets have, uh, are, are shown in real time on Nicole's dress. Um, this is uh, technology behind Cute Circuit's um, smart textile dress. So uh, this is a very, very cool example of you know how fashion and technology can merge together and, and build something. So um, on the right, right side, you can see um, a product that's built by a Japanese company, Shinoma. So uh, they built this um, smart, smart skin, e-skin, um, which basically tracks your body temperature, um, you know, sweat. Um, it has all kinds of sensors, but it's very stretchable. So when you wear it, you don't even feel the sensors. Um, this is another example of smart textiles. Um, then technology, I always say it has to be beautiful, it has to be visually appealing to, um, to, to anyone who's wearing it because technology at the end of the day, um, if it's embedded in the, into something that we wear, um, it needs to be extension of us. So, but it has to be functional as well. You know, um, wearable tech products shouldn't be problem for a solution. They should be solution for a problem, right? Um, and obviously, there's a lot of um, gimmicks currently. The whole industry is very early stage, but there are some really good examples how um, wearable technology can solve real everyday problems and challenges. So, on the light, on the left side, um, is a NIMB ring. Um, it's a safety device. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of small jewelry, basically, that um, has a button. So um, it has been built by and designed by a lady from Russia. Um, she exhibited at this year's wearable tech show. Um, she was attacked and she was stabbed nine times and she survived. So um, after that, she decided she was adamant to, to build something that would basically um, help her in the future if something simple uh, happens to her or anyone else. So when your hands are tied, there's not, there's not much you can do with your phone. You cannot call anyone. But if you have a ring on your finger, then you can press the button and you can call someone and alert someone, a police or you know, a member of a family. Um, on, the right, uh, on the right side, you can see a smartwatch, Gator smartwatch, um, developed by um, one of our community members, Colleen Wong. Um, and um, she basically decided to build this product because uh, she didn't want to buy a very expensive smartphone to her children. 
uh, they're, I think, you know, five, five years of age. And um, it basically has very two simple functions. Um, it has a GPS tracker, so uh, you can track your child uh, so it doesn't get lost, right? Uh, which was uh, the reason why she built it in the first place, because her child, I think, got lost in, in the woods. And then um, if it does ha something like that happens, um, you can call your child or he or she can call you um, based on the phone numbers you put into into the watch. So basically those, are the all, uh, those, those two functions are the only features the smartwatch has. Um, you won't have any social media, any kind of that kind of stuff, um, which can be quite damaging for a very young child. But they will still feel very important and, you know, happy to wear something like this and almost fashionable. So, um, I'll tell you now a little bit more about my journey in the wearable tech space um, and and my business, um, my smart umbrella business. So um, three years ago. Um, me and my co-founders, I'm originally from Croatia and um, we, we all lived in Rijeka, which is um, cra cra a small city uh, along the coastline and um, although during summer we get a lot of uh, sun and weather it's amazing and beautiful, uh, during winter we get a lot of rain and, and wind, so um, we came to an idea to build our own umbrella brand but we wanted to build it with a twist, so um, we want to uh, build an unlosable umbrella. So um, we launched Keisha in December 2014, after we raised some pre-seed money and uh, after we built you know, a couple of hundreds of units um, that we wanted to sell. Um, and we just said, you know, decided, let's, let's give it a go. Let's see how it goes. So the idea behind the umbrella is fairly simple. It's a hardware product. It's, a, it's an umbrella like any other umbrella. Um, we embedded a, a beacon in this strap around the umbrella, so which you use to tie, tie the umbrella. Um, and we have an app, uh, iOS and Android app. So once when you download the app to your phone, you basically pair your umbrella with your phone. Um, and you know, if you leave it in a public place, you'll get push notification to your phone that you left it there. Um, this is a very common problem. I'm pretty sure that you know this happened to most of us at some point um, when we um, did our research for the um, for the umbrellas. You know what's the market size for this? We found that 33 million umbrellas are sold every year in the U.S. and um, 4.2 million in the U.K. But when it comes to umbrellas that get lost, um, it struck me that. 11,000 umbrellas are lost every year only on London Tube. So uh, there's obviously, you know, a very common, this is obviously a very common problem. So um, we, we decide that, you know, we want to see if, if this whole idea holds water and if we can, if we can monetize this. So after we, um, you know, started selling, we sold out everything we had. So like 700 units in about three months or so. Um, we raised some uh, seed money from our lead investor. Um, we are continuously selling now for more than two years. Um, and we are now raising Series A. So the problem with hardware, which I'm pretty sure most of you know, is that it's very expensive. Um, problem with hardware is that, you know, it, tends, it takes time to build, you know, um, you know, first prototype, second, third, you know, uh, and then uh, I would say that, based on my experience with with investors in the UK and Europe, unfortunately, Europe and in the UK is not predominantly, you know, emerging tech slash IoT um, ecosystem. Um, it's still quite a, that's still a much focus on on fintech and SaaS and e-commerce. So. Um, through my work with Women of Wearables, um, I, I actually connected with a lot of organizations in Asia and US, and they are um, much much far ahead than, than the UK. So um, I'm keen to build an ecosystem between US investors and Asian investors because there's a lot of talent in the UK and there's a lot of you know great ideas and great products when it comes to IoT. Um, but it, it, it's a bit problematic, I would say, to raise and grow and scale the business if you're if you're building IoT B2C product. 
Um, so this is just, you know, food for thought for anyone who's building um, IoT product. Think about the business model and think, you know, how do you want to phrase the whole thing in order to, you know, increase your chances for, for raising money. Um, so my second business, which is basically an organization initiative, uh, like a social enterprise, is Women of Wearables. So, um, you can find us on Twitter and all, and all other social media channels. So um, Women of Wearables uh, started about a year ago uh, when I met my co-founder Michelle Hua from Manchester. Um, and uh, Michelle has also her own wearable tech business, um, still in, in, in product development stage. And we, you know, we, when we connected at Wearable Tech Show last year, we, we realized that we pretty much have both have the same problems and you know struggles and you know where do we connect with people how do we get to funding where do we find advisors and mentors so we decided to do something about it and um, we started women of wearables um, it first started on social media then in October we launched a website and today I think we have more than even more than I would say 7,000 members now um, we have a great network of partners and we have communities in more than 20 countries. Um, our first international chapter that we launched about a month and a half, two months ago, um, was in Berlin. Um, we have our ambassador there um, and we are now negotiating with um, potential ambassadors in Singapore, in China, in LA, in San Francisco, in Netherlands, um, all over the world basically. That, that, Every day, almost someone you know reaches out to us and says, um, "We want to launch Wow here. We want to organize some events for women in wearable tech space and fashion tech, IoT, VR, AR." So, uh, what is actually Women of Wearables? So, we are UK's and Europe's first organization, um, you know, that wants to support and connect and inspire and empower women in in these industries, um, wearable technology, fashion technology, smart tech selves. Um, IoT, VR, AR. Um, as I said, we are based in London. I'm based in London. Michelle is based in Manchester, and our Berlin ambassador is based there. So um, our mission is to, in general, encourage women and diverse teams to participate in building hardware products um, and software products as designers, because we think that um, you know a lot of wearable tech products. Uh, out there are still designed by men for men so we definitely want to bring more women into into the whole design process um, to to work a little bit more on aesthetics of the wearable tech products because a lot of them are very clunky and I personally wouldn't wear them maybe as a woman um, so and also just you know increase diverse the racial diverse teams in wearable tech space in tech space in general and create more jobs for women in STEM um, we also think that you know, just because maybe a woman is not in a tech role, she can be she can work in a non-tech role in a wearable tech space or IoT space, which is great because women um, bring that different type of mindset, analytical mindset, sometimes to the business that can really really help you. And in general, diverse businesses, um, diverse companies have proven to be uh, to execute better than than non-diverse ones. Um, so. These are some products. Over the next two slides, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about, you know, some products that our community members are building. Um, they are all designed by by women. Of course, they have men in their teams, but um, they either have most of majority of the majority of their teams are women, uh, or they have female designers. So, um, on left, Quema is a safety device, a safety bracelet. Um, the founder is from Miami. Um, it's something similar to uh, NIMB ring, the safety ring that I talked about, but this is a bracelet. Um, then Ava bracelet, uh, which you can see in the um, bottom left corner, is a fertility bracelet, basically, that measures all sorts of data, um, your, you know, your breathing, your ovulation, your body temperature, um, and basically tracks your ovulation. So it's a, it's a wearable health tech device. Um, then Lab Fresh, so this white shirt you see in the middle, um, it's very, it's, it's a project um, that started by Lab Fresh team in Netherlands. Uh, they were on a Kickstarter, I think, um, a few months ago. Um, it's a very, um, it's a great smart textiles in a way that you know it doesn't have any sensors, but a type of, it's a type of shirt that is very breathable. Um, you won't get any stains on it uh, if you spill something. 
Um, it's very, um, I would say, durable material as well, but it's very gentle on the skin as well. It's 100% cotton, so um, it's really, really good. Um, and then on the right side, um, our Annie from Bonnie Binary, um, she has been experimenting with these um, sensors and red lights embedded into, into jacket. Um, and there's also, um, you can also download the app so you can basically, um, you know, work, you can work between your app and your jacket in a way that um, you can, you can uh, choose which type of light you, wanna, you want to run on the jacket. Um, it's still very much, you know, experimental, but um, it's a great example of, you know, how you can work, how you can create something um, when it comes to merging software with hardware. Um, then Bolt Technologies, um, bottom right corner, it's a company from India, um, and they have like a all like a round product of offering both app and um, sneakers and uh, fitness trackers, like a bracelet. So um, you can you can measure your you know your steps and and you know your exercise your exercising through sensors that are embedded in the sneakers, uh, and then you know read that data. Uh, from the app and from the from the fitness tracker, um, they raised a, a big round, I think, and they have a big team in India. Um, then, th this is really cool project that I think I'm not sure if the Kickstarter campaign is running at the moment, but um, they they did run our Kickstarter campaign late uh, recently. So um, Woogie, uh, Woogie is a, a device for children, so it's a, like a toy, IoT toy that uh, enables you to um, learn uh, through very interactive like simple games um, and you know conversations that you exchange with the with the toy so um, really really cool project that also went through um, startup bootcamp iot devices accelerator program um, last uh, winter um, then bottom uh, left corner is era so um, it's a small camera that you can attach to um, Google glasses or type of small glasses um, that basically is aiming to help uh, blind and visually impaired people. Um, it's a uh, very similar to um, it's some sort of AR VR uh, wearable device, um, and uh, I was amazed actually by you know how far can we go by um, you know using VR AR devices and wearable devices for um, health for medicine. Um, really, really cool project. Then uh, Bloom Life. Bloom Life is a pregnancy fertility uh, device uh, that basically enables you to um, track and count, you know, uh, contractions and also, you know, heartbeats of your of your baby in a womb. Um, and they are based in the U.S. Um, then um, this is a project. Not sure if this is from Anina or Lena from Berlin. Um, it's a it's a dress, a Medusa dress. So it lights up when you wear it. Uh, another great example of uh, you know fashion emerging with technology and and building smart textiles. Um, and then on the right side, something very very exciting that um, I I found out about at the Wearable Tech Show this year. Um, this is a, a smart glove built by Hadil. Um, Hadil is a lady from Saudi Arabia that's just uh, finishing her PhD here in, in London. Um, and this glove basically uh, has technology um, that you wear as part of your glove. So, um, and then um, it translates sign language into text and speech. So it's amazing. We had Hadil um, speaking at our meetup, uh, Women in Wearables meetup in April, and I was amazed because um, she was first speaking um, using um, sign speech, and then the exact same words came out of uh, this little microphone on the, on the glove. Um, and it's, it's groundbreaking, and it's actually, what I'm most amazed about is that she's already building her, I think, fourth or fifth prototype after wearable tech show. So she's basically had, she had basically one prototype per month which is amazing. Um, and she's doing this as part of her PhD um, thesis. Um, she has some partners in the US and she wants to build this technology and give it away for free to people. So um, 
for now her idea is not to monetize it at all because she wants just to want to you know um, provide value and, and create impact for for the community of you know um, of those people who who who, who will benefit most from from using it so what do we do what does wow as an organization do um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about you know what we can do for you know early stage companies or just you know community of IOT community in general so we organize monthly events um, in London um, we'll have a break during summer but we usually uh, our events run every month so in April we had one on women and wearable technology in May we had one on um, wearable tech for pets and animals um, last month actually this month we had one on fashion technology um, so to some topics that we will explore in the future are you know women and AI um, digital health tech um, femtech as well so um, focus is always around you know women but of course we welcome men and we have um, men as speakers as well so um, Michelle and I are both uh, startup mentors um, I'm trying to you know share as much as, of my own knowledge uh, as I can because I think you know as a female founder especially a lot of women are solo founders it can be a very lonely um, journey a very lonely path to go if if you, if you don't have a community to share uh, to share that path with so uh, and also you know a lot of women you know they need sometimes just a little bit of help um, they, they cannot decide what to do so I'm trying to help as much as I can uh, and or connect with with the people I know and then we organize a lot of workshops as well Michelle is in charge of wearable tech workshops um, where she teaches you know basics of um, you know um, circuitry you know how to use conductive thread um, how to sew how to basically create a smart textile um, while I'm more on business uh, marketing uh, strategy um, workshops because a lot of um, it's it's already enough that you know it's very hard to build hardware business uh, emerging tech business but then when it comes to you know how do I actually monetize the whole thing how do I promote the whole thing and with Keisha I got a great amount of knowledge and you know experience because um, since we bootstrapped from the very beginning when it when it comes to marketing um, I was basically forced to learn everything myself so um, so far we get uh, we got great coverage in in media I mean um, I'm leading OPR uh, for, for Keisha so we have been profiled in you know Wired UK, TechCrunch, uh, Financial Times, um, BuzzFeed um, so I'm trying to share that knowledge with with you know companies that approach us uh, through women of wearables because um, most of them don't even know where to start with um, at the end of the day um, you don't need to have huge budget for it a lot of things you can do for free yourself so I'm just trying to share that knowledge as well um, so these are some photos from um, from our events um, from our workshops um, I'm very passionate about, you know, encouraging women to educate themselves about uh, wearable technology because I think that's where it should start. Um, and the problem of, you know, not having enough women in tech, enough women in STEM, cannot be solved overnight uh, because it didn't happen overnight. Um, it can be solved only by, you know, uh, approaching it from all different angles. So just raising awareness about the problem. Uh, obviously helps but we need to actively do something about it we need to educate women and um, because you know women's and men's brains work in a different way um, when, it, when it comes to education of women um, it needs to be done in a very creative way because if we expect women to sit in front of a laptop and code all the time that probably won't attract more women into this industry but if we show them that technology can be very creative, very diverse, and that there's so much they can do if they decide to go into STEM, into the world of IoT in general, um, I think we'll probably increase the ratio of women. Um, so, so that's it basically about me. Um, I, I encourage everyone to you know, get in touch with me. Um, with, with, I would love to provide any help for our Women in Wearables Network. If there are any you know, female founders and entrepreneurs in IoT space, I would love to profile them on our website. We have a section, Wow Women, um, where we interview women um, and publish those interviews on our website because we think that um, they deserve to get visibility. 
Uh, and just because someone you know is based maybe in Japan or Canada or France, it doesn't mean that you know everyone around the world in our community should know about them. Um, and I think by building this talent pool of women and men, because we do need men, they are part of the um, solution as equally as they are part of the problem, um, we, we will uh, build great tech ecosystem in the UK, in Europe, and hopefully in five, ten years, um, we will be somewhere you know, close to, to what Silicon Valley has. We don't have to be the same, but I think there's a lot of talent. So um, I think if, if we can collaborate all together, especially encouraging collaborations between corporates and startups and universities, um, we can create much, much better and more efficient ecosystem, IoT ecosystem. Perfect. That's it. Thank you so Fantastic. much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Round of applause. Okay.